We are in the year of grace. 2016 is Extraordinary Jubilee of Mercy as decreed by Pope Francis and Year of the Eucharist and Family as declared by the Philippine Bishops in preparation for our uh, 500 years anniversary of Christianity in the Philippines. And all this is happening as we hurdle the obstacle in a race against time to protect our common home and to take charge of this home which has been entrusted to us knowing that all the good which exists here will be taken up into the heavenly feast as mentioned in Laudato Si number 244. Today we who have been entrusted with the specific task of instructing our people to our faith are gathered to discuss our unified plan of action on our catechesis on mercy, Eucharist, and family, and caring for our common home. We are gathered in one special place in our country, known all over the world for its collective efforts in protecting biodiversity. Surrounded by the gift of creation, and thus, in most cases, or resuscitated in some, we, we ask ourselves, do we see in nature the hand of God? Do we see the source in all the created things? And we will also go further, rather more specific, are we, as the Church, inclusive and welcoming, a sign of mercy for all? Are our families seats of humble, joyful, and loving service for each other and also for others? As I open our session with this keynote, keynote message, I would like to start by, by, by reflection about the theme given to us by the Holy Father. Be merciful just as the Father is merciful. The theme invites us to fix our eyes on the Father who is merciful and to be like Him. To reach the highest expression of our love for Him to the point of desiring to be like Him. There was a boy who was asked what he wanted to be when he grows up and the boy said, I want to be a great digger. It's a sepulchrero. Surprised by his answer, the man asked, why not a doctor, or a lawyer, or a priest, etc.? Why great digger, he asked. The child simply responded, because my father is a great digger. If we are truly sons and daughters of God, our Father, it is normal to, for us to desire to be like Him. In a way, this is also fixing our gaze on Jesus, the sacrament by excellence of the love and compassion of the Father in heaven. Several times in the Gospel of John, he tells us, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. The highest expression of his being the sacrament by excellence of the Father was when he gave all and died on the cross out of love for his Father, but all of us. We priests are addressed as fathers and nuns, uh, as mothers, especially the superiors like uh, Mother Jess. Those who are older are called Lolo or Lola, because we are supposed to be spiritual fathers and mothers to people. The theme for the Jubilee of Mercy reminds us to be like our merciful Father in heaven. Not the disciplinarian Father, not the valiant and courageous Father, hindi yung matapang o mabagsik, but the Father who is merciful. 
Madaling sabihin ito, ngunit mahirap gawin. It's indeed a, a very tall order because this would demand giving all. How can we be like the Father who is merciful? First, I think it is important that we enter into a deep relationship with Him, with the Father. At the heart of every calling is the experience of our love relationship with God. I had my 30-day retreat just before entering fourth-year theology in San Carlos Seminary at the Britannia Retreat House in Baguio. In this retreat, I realized how much the Lord loved me immensely. During the first days, I was discovering God's love in creation, in the little things that I had, and in the many things the Lord had gifted me. During the, the first days, I understood that God knew me even before I was born. He was there in every moment of my life. He knew my limitations, my sinfulness, my vulnerability, and my nothingness. He was walking and journeying with me. As Isaiah 43, 1-5 puts it, But now, thus says the Lord, who created you and formed you, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the water, I will be with you. In the rivers, you shall not drown. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. The flames shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, your Savior, because you are precious in my eyes and glorious. And because I love you, fear not, for I am with you. During that retreat, I was like a child in front of God, always ready to listen. This experience made me understood that God knows me in and out. As the psalmist would say, such knowledge is beyond me, far too lofty for me to reach. You form my inmost being. You need me in my mother's womb. I praise you. So wonderfully you made me. Wonderful are your works. My very soul in you. I remember in one of my colloquium with my spiritual director, the late Father Ben Carlos, a Jesuit priest, I was crying and sobbing as if discovering and realizing for the first time his great and immense love for me. I cried too hard that the good Father Ben, instead of giving me a handkerchief, he gave me a big towel. I felt that I was entering into a more serious love relationship with the Lord. After that, I felt so light, so free, and I started to jog from the Tanya Retreat House to the chapel of the Pink Sisters, then to the Cathedral of Baguio. Coming out from the chapel of the Pink Sisters, I met a beggar. I felt so much the desire to share the love that I had in my heart, to let to let her know and that the, and I wanted to share really the love that I was experiencing uh, inside me. And so instead of just giving her some coins, I decided to buy her something to eat then proceeded to the cathedral. When I entered the cathedral, I knelt down and my attention was caught by the responsorial psalm written on the whiteboard. You are my beloved son. Today I have begotten you. I understood that those words were meant for me. I am begotten by God. He loves me. I am a son of God. I was so confident that he will be with me always. And I knew that with God nothing is impossible. I understood that to be holy meant to enter into a process of filiation. Becoming truly a son with a son as I was reciprocating the love of God for me. That experience gave me a lot of confidence and cast away a lot of my fears. We have to experience His mercy and love for us. Ang kanyang paulit-ulit na pagpapatawad sa kabila ng paulit-ulit na kasalanan ginagawa. 
ang kanyang mapagbigay ng providensya sa mga sandali ng pangangailangan, ang kanyang banayad na pagkagali, ang kanyang hindi mapagusgang pagmamahal, mapagmalasakit sa mga nasa gilid-gilid o yung mga nasa teritoris na sinasabi ng ating Santo Papa. Kagaya ng pinapaalala sa atin ng banal na kasulatan, lalong lalo na yung mga ebanghelyo, ang kanyang paghahanap sa naliligaw, ang kanyang paghuhugas ng paa, at marami pang iba. Immersed in His life and love, not only do we desire to be like Him, but we become like Him. This is what Confucius said, He who lives with a great man becomes great. Kung ano ang paulit-ulit na nararanasan sa Diyos na ating Ama, yun din dapat ang maging tayo sa isa't isa at sa bayan ng Diyos. As we reflect on the theme of our gathering which is based on the exhortation of the Philippine bishops for the Jubilee of Mercy, and the year of the family in the Eucharist on bended knees, catechesis for the Jubilee of Mercy, we have to understand that even this posture of kneeling is a gesture that we see in God our Father. He gave His only Son, welted Himself up to the point of dying as a criminal on the cross. The Incarnation is an image of God who kneels down before man to reach out to each of us. I will uh, reveal to you a secret. Don't talk about it not to anyone. You keep it to yourself. At least I die lang. No? <laughs> now once I was called to, I uh, was called by our papal good show and asked me about the, a bishop candidate who was being branded as teaching heresies about the Eucharist as if saying that Jesus is not really present in the Eucharist. I told the nuncio that maybe it is more because I know the priest uh, I told him that maybe it is more of a misinterpretation because this priest would always emphasize the descending movement that happens in every Eucharistic celebration. God becoming man and that man becoming, becoming God. God becoming man and God in Jesus becoming bread. He did not deem equality with God but emptied himself. This many times is being set aside. God kneels down before us, a gesture of God's humility. His priest is, uh, is, for you to know, is now a bishop. The bishops of the Philippines are not really deviating from the theme given by the Holy Father when they present kneeling as a gesture most appropriate for us to respond to the grace of 2016. On bended knees, we become like the Father. We kneel again in body, heart, and soul because we believe it is a sure way to renewal in our times, becoming merciful like the Father. Begging for mercy, we kneel in repentance. Adoring the Eucharist, we kneel down and worship. With humble service, we kneel in the family and wash one another's feet. With humble service, As I said, we kneel in the family and was one another's feet. If we dream of renewal, let us kneel again in repentance, in adoration, and in service. Contrary to the idea that is being pushed by some liberal minds, even among our ranks, kneeling is not something that we borrow or inherited from pagans. It is a practice that we learn from the scriptures. In the book, The Spirit of Liturgy, the then Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger wrote, Kneeling does not come from any culture. It comes from the Bible and its knowledge of God. Further, he said, the central importance of kneeling in the Bible can be seen in a very concrete way. 
the word proskinein alone occurs 59 times in the New Testament. 24 of which are in the Apocalypse, the book of the heavenly liturgy, which is pre presented to the church as the standard for her own liturgy. But closer inspection, we can discern three closely related forms of posture. First, there is postancho, lying with one's face to the ground before the overwhelming power of God. Secondly, especially in the New Testament, there is falling to one's knees before another. And thirdly, there is kneeling. Kneeling for mercy. Kneeling is the ultimate posture of submission and surrender. Kneeling before God and before one another to ask for mercy is a long practice mentioned both in the Old and New Testaments. In the Gospel of Matthew, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him to beg him to cure his epileptic son. And in Mark 1.40, a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees. If you are willing, you can make me clean. In both cases, kneeling is an act of supplication. Both men knelt before Jesus not so much in adoration, but in complete surrender with faith that He alone can heal. They knelt to ask for mercy, which Jesus gave to them. We kneel to ask mercy from God and from one another. Kneeling is an expression of our humility. When we come to God in the sacrament of reconciliation, we humbly confess our sins with our knees contoured almost touching the ground. In this position, we are helpless. We cannot run in fear while kneeling. Instead, a faithful and contrite hand finds in God those loving hands that will help him stand and be healed. What gesture touches the offended heart more than an offender on his knees? In this position of vulnerability, hearts are touched and offenses are mended. I believe the Christian would not melt in his love for the other when he or she approaches him or her in bended knees. To my mind, the painting of Rembrandt on the prodigal son who knelt before his father captures very vividly the scene that pour out love like a flowing river from the heart of the father to the younger son. There is a very recent experience that was told to me. A Paris priest who himself is known to be very proud and hard-hearted, bigas ang puso, mahirap magpatawad, it would take him years really before he could uh, could forgive. There was uh, a very recent experience of his. He really uh, got very angry with his assistant palace priest. And uh, as I said in his previous experiences, it would, take, it would take him years before he could really forgive. But this time, it took him only four or five days because his assistant, Paris Prince, had the humility to kneel down. He really knelt down before him and really begged for his forgiveness. Sometimes we can really be very hard uh, to one another. And, uh, the only way to, to really bridge with this gap among us will be to acknowledge with humility our, our uh, mistakes and really beg, really literally beg for uh, one another's forgiveness. We also kneel to worship. We genuflect and kneel before the Blessed Sacrament to indicate by bodily attitude, our respect and adoration for the Lord. 
the total submission of our minds and hearts to Him who is truly present in the Holy Eucharist. Although there have been moves and uh, they are not few consciously or unconsciously to remove from our norms and practices the act of kneeling in prayer. One example of this is the practice of kneeling before the Sanctus until the Great Amen in the Eucharist, which has been removed since the early 90s. Thank God our, our bishops to Archbishop saw further last January 2016 that this act must be returned and returned, retained in our Eucharistic celebrations. For it is only proper that living in adoration must be brought back to the consciousness of every Catholic in fitting response to the hymn of Christ in Philippians 2.6. To 11 at the feet of Jesus all knees should bend in heaven and on the earth and among the dead this is from Philippians 2 uh, verse 10 although uh, if you are a liturgist uh, you, you must know this but there's still a controversy about this with our, our liturgists they're still uh, uh, talking about this among themselves and they will discuss this, I think, uh, with the uh, Archbishop song. Jesus also knelt in prayer. St. Luke tells us how Jesus fell on his knees and prayed on the night before he was taken by the enemies. It is while kneeling that he gave that very beautiful prayer of total surrender to the Father and of entrusting the unity of those entrusted to his care. Kneeling gives us the proper attitude in prayer. It shows our humility before God. It is a continuation of a tradition practiced by the church from the first century until today. Twenty centuries after Jesus suffered, died and rose again for us. For this reason, I fell before the Father says uh, Paul in his letter to the Ephesians and in Acts as it is written, Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed for the dead man who was resuscitated through his prayer. Kneeling as a body, bodily gesture cannot be separated from its meaning in the spiritual sphere. When kneeling, becomes merely external, a merely physical act, it becomes meaningless. On the other hand, when someone tries to take worship back into the purely spiritual realm and refuses to give it embodied form, the act of worship evaporates. For what is purely spiritual is inappropriate to the nature of man. Worship is one of those fundamental acts that, if, that affect the whole man. That is why bending the knee before the presence of the living God is something we cannot abandon. This is from uh, Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, The Theology of Kneeling. Kneeling for service. Kneeling, therefore, is also an inner attitude that we all must develop if we want to grow in our charity. Our bishops tell us that we kneel to serve like the Lord with a story on the washing of the feet of the apostles as our model. We reach out to one another on bended knees of a humble servant that's standing upright on our, our feet like an autocrat. On our feet like an autocrat. We kneel in service because it is only by doing so that we realize that we are not omnipotent. We have a God who is the source of everything good. And we have a neighbor who can supplement our weakness. That we are not born for ourselves alone. Walang nabubuhay para sa sarili lamang. Make us a part of a bigger community that supports one another. In, in fact, despair comes to those who work in the ministry when they start to believe that they are in charge and that they know everything. Happiness, truth.
true happiness in the ministry comes to those who live every moment of their lives, knowing that they too need somebody. It is very interesting that nurses and caregivers are taught that bending through the knees is essential. Health educators also advise us to bend our knees when lifting things. It is essential in raising someone up. We gather our strengths from our bended knees. This is very symbolic of how we gather strength in serving others to our bended knees. It is humility at its best. It is humility par excellence. Our humiliation which weakens us, humility, unlike humiliation which weakens us, humility makes us strong. Serving on bended knees has two marks that cannot be separated. Silence and simplicity. Cardinal Chito Tagle said during the Synod on New Evangelization that to be an effective evangelizer, the church cannot and must not pretend to have easy answers to the dilemmas facing men and women today. Instead, he said, it must be an attentive and listening church because only in this way will people believe that God listens to them too. But it is not easy to keep quiet. It is not easy to listen. Some people do not have time to really digest the word being said to them. Still others tend to formulate, formulate the answers to inquiries before, <coughs> even before the inquirer is done talking. I believe this is what we do This is what we, we do not want to be labeled walang alam, like, walang alam. Uh, so you, you back in uh, always as, just to, to prove na may alam ka. We think we help people by telling them what we know. On the contrary, in most cases, we, we help others all the more by listening to their stories. Simplicity of life is also a very important sign of kneeling for service. The church must always shun arrogance, hypocrisy, and bigotry. And now in the conclusion, I hope you will start waking up. Maybe it is important that we put ourselves in front of God and make an honest goodness examination of conscience or maybe an examination of life. Can we recall, recall an experience when we felt we entered into a process of filiation or a process of becoming a son or daughter of the Father in heaven? Is there a desire in our hearts and soul to become merciful like the Father? Katulad na ba tayo ng Ama sa kanyang pagkamahabagin? Mahabagin ba tayo sa salita at gawa? Ako sa aking pagninilay, nakita ko na marami pa akong kakainin bigas. Hindi pa napupunta, napupuntahan ang marami pang nasa gilid-gilid sa aming mga parokya. Hindi pa kami modelo ng pagpapatawad sa isa't isa as a, as a presbyter in our diocese. Ang dami pang dapat gawin, kaya nga siguro kailangan talaga itong uh, taon-taon na pagpapalibago ng pangako bilang mga pari every holy Thursday. With the attitude of dealing, how do we catechize the faithful? such that in a world marred with materialism which results in the callousness of heart among the many, how do we as a church proclaim Jesus the meek and humble of heart? 
How do we teach the faithful to take care and protect the earth and all creation as a way of loving the Creator who saw all that He had made and it was very good? How do we bring back all to the mercy of God who is always ready to welcome us? Through the sacrament of reconciliation and the Eucharist. How do we respond to the ever-growing hunger and thirst of our young people for Christ? Are we still the reflection of the fatherly love and mercy of God to our, to our dear young people? In the World Day, the World Youth Day in Madrid in 2011, our beloved Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI gave the youth of the world the Eucat, a great tool for us catechists and for young people to discover the beauty of our faith spoken in the language of young people for young people i would like to believe this is the church's way of kneeling before our young people and go to the level and speak their language i hope that you utilize this great tool for evangelization and I think that it is divine providence that in July of this year, during the World Day, World Youth Day in Krakow, our Holy Father Francis will give to the youth of the world the Doka, the, so the social doctrines of the Church, written and interpreted for young people. Once again, our Holy Father expresses his desire to concretize our faith through mercy and service as beautifully, beautifully revealed to us in our social doctrines. We have these great treasures for our perusal and we thank God for it. Bago po magtatapos, gusto kong muling ipaalala na sa buong taon, tayong lahat ay inangyayahang makitulad sa ating Ama Salani Kagaya ng sinabi ko sa simula, itong mensahe, ang talugtok ng pakikitulad ni Jesus sa kanyang ama ay ang kanyang kamatayan sa krus noong ibinigay niya lahat para sa kanyang ama at sa atin. Ang turo sa atin, sa atin tungkol sa Santisima Trinidad ay ibinigay ng ama ang lahat para sa kanyang anak from all eternity. For all eternity, the Father gave everything to the Son. Walang itinira sa sarili. Ito din sa atang maging sukatan natin sa pagbibigay. Buhos, taos, lubos, at lubos. May the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of Mercy, bring us kneeling at the foot of the cross in every Eucharist we celebrate. And there we discover the joy of God's tenderness in our family, in our environment. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. Can we have uh, two minutes of uh, silence just to relish the message of our Bishop Chairman on this year's theme, which is on bended knees focusing on the merciful Father, on bended knees as we serve one another, on bended knees as we ask forgiveness from the Father. <clears throat> 